Hi, I'm David Hughes, uh, CEO of Silver Peak. Um, back again to uh, go into a bit of detail about our uh, dynamic path control. So dynamic path control is uh, what we at Silver Peak um, use to describe the functionality that we have to select between multiple paths. So I've determined I want to go from this location to this location. Now between there, there's multiple paths. There's going over the over MPLS, there's going over internet, there's going over, say, LTE. And then there's potentially the cross connecting between them. So you may leave on Comcast on this branch and arrive on LTE. So there's actually, a, even just between two locations, there's potentially a mesh of tunnels, a mesh of paths that you can take. And so dynamic path control is the functionality that chooses on a um, session by session or packet by packet basis, which of those paths to take. So we've had um, uh, dynamic path control capability um, in our products for a couple of years now. Um, the, um, the kind of path control that we have um, deployed is flow by flow. So for each flow, we make a decision. We can move traffic mid-flow, but it's basically flow-based balancing. What we've seen is that there's also um, a lot of cases where it's really helpful to be able to think of things packet by packet. And one of the uh, new functionalities which we've introduced is this idea of bonded tunnels. Um, and so if you kind of step back and kind of go through what we do today with flow by flow, there are uh, multiple choices in terms of how you choose a path. So for this new flow arrives, you can say, I want to choose the lowest latency path. I want to choose the lowest loss path. I want a low balance, uh, potentially with um, um, constraints. So I want to choose any of these three paths, but not more than 100 milliseconds or not more than 1% loss. Um, we have the idea of preferred and fallback paths. So there may be a uh, path that you would prefer to take regardless of the metrics, or there may be a path which you'd rather not take unless you really have to. So LTE, because you're usually paying by the byte depending on the plan, that's often, that would often be a fallback path. Um, with the flow-by-flow -flow path selection, Ford Error Correction operates automatically on a per tunnel, per traffic class um, basis. And so if there's no loss, there's no overhead as loss begins to ramp up. If, we, um, if it's the kind of loss that Ford Error Correction can address, we will ramp the Ford Error Correction up and, uh, and correct that loss. The new thing that comes... Say per traffic class, do you do that only for applications that can benefit from it? or? Yeah, so it's a good question because, you know, sometimes you hear people say, and you'll even hear us say it sometimes, we can do something for an individual app or by app. And often, at least with Silver Peak, when we say that, there's thousands and thousands of apps. And so you don't want to have to write down what you do for every single one of your apps. And so we have the idea of grouping apps into application groups or traffic classes. And so typically a user is going to have something like half a dozen, maybe 10, um, traffic classes, so real-time traffic, um, replication traffic, um, recreational web, SaaS services, or whatever. And so it's on the basis of those groups that you can choose or not choose to use for error correction. Um, with packet by packet, um, what we're doing is taking, say, a pair to two paths, MPLS and internet in this example, and bonding them together, like the way you know, link aggregation works. And then um, we, uh, if, if uh, you know, have one of them fail, that's fine. If both of them fail, then we can fall back to say LTE. The packet by packet um, uh, technology is, can do a lot of different things, but to make it really simple, we wrap it up with kind of two options, two kind of macro settings. The first is high availability. And so what high availability means is that we're using um, all of the links that are available and we're sending enough redundant information. We're using erasure coding for, for, for an error correction. We're sending enough um, error correction information so that we can mask a full path failure. So in this case, there's enough going over each side so that if one side fails, we have enough information to reconstruct um, all of the original data. Um, because we're using erasure coding, we can deal with simultaneous brownouts. So even if you've got 20% loss on this side and 30% loss on this side, we're getting effectively 150% of the packets through, if you think about it from a point of view of one link, 
and that's easily enough to be able to reconstruct the lost data. Um, you know, yeah, I think you've probably seen other alternatives that use duplicates, where you duplicate packets. Um, because we're doing erasure coding, we're much more robust than a duplicate. Because duplicate, you have, say, 10% loss on both links. There's a 1% chance you hit the same, the dupli both duplicates. Both uh, drop. Yeah. Case, you can actually reconstruct yeah. what's missing. Yes, yeah. yes. And you know, another thing that's, that's interesting about using forward error correction, say you t took a group of packets, like a group of 20 packets, and you generated 20 error correction packets. You send all 40 packets through the network spread across these paths. The first 20 packets is enough to rebuild things. So it doesn't really matter whether it was one of the original packets or a packet with error correction information. The first 20 get you there. So you're naturally always taking the lowest latency path because you're in parallel exploring or using all of them. And so rather than having to wait for a measurement to decide which path, you're actually using all of them and you're getting the benefit of the lowest possible latency um, across the network. So we, we see this as being a real key to delivering things like VOIP or video streaming at a high quality with only internet. Because quite a lot of people today are looking at hybrid with you know, internet complementing MPLS. And part of the reason for keeping the MPLS around is because there may be video conferencing or VOIP or other applications that are really sensitive to quality that you're worried about putting on a raw internet. We believe that with this type of capability, a lot of that kind of traffic could be carried across a pair of internet links rather than relying on MPLS. That doesn't mean we don't support MPLS. We, you know, we want to do whatever the customer wants to do. We'll let them use MPLS if they want or move to a pure internet environment. The other setting for the um, bonded tunnels is what we call maximum or high throughput. Again, this is using the um, space-time erasure coding. And it uses multiple paths to maximize throughput, but we're trying to use the paths to get more capacity rather than better availability. So if we had a 10 megabit MPLS path and a 20 megabit per second internet path, we're creating an effective tunnel of 30 megabits per second. And indeed, a single flow, if you have a single flow test, it will see the aggregate capacity um, of that link. And again, um, as with the existing technology, we can adjust the error correction overhead based on the loss that we're seeing. Um, so if there's no loss, there's no overhead. As loss creeps up, we'll move to, to kind of higher order erasure codes to be able to compensate for that. So um, single flow, parts of that flow are going to hit all the links in this case? Yes. Yes. And in both in this case, a single flow is pinned to a single path until there's a disruption. If there's a disruption, it will get moved. But basically, the flows are the flows are sticky to paths. With this, um, a single flow may have packets going over multiple paths. And so there's, uh, obviously we have reordering and um, fragmentation, re reassembly, all of that stuff going on. So that from the point of view of someone outside of the overlay, it just looks like a nice clean link. Is, the, is that flow going to experience consistent throughput that, or sorry, consistent round trip latency that matches the worst path? Um, that's a gr great question. You're, yes. So this high availability mode, you're going to see um, latency, which is um, the, basically the minimum latency. The best one. The best one. Yeah. With high put throughput, you'll tend to see most, some of the time, the, you'll, there's a bigger variance in the latency. It goes from the minimum to the maximum, and you'll see it. You'll, so you'll see that variation. Depending on which packet. Depending on which, where, yes, where the yes. Of that packet landed. Yeah, yeah. Still on the uh, the burden of reassembling and reordering falls on the receiving Silver Peak appliance yes, and what it emerges there from. Yes. It, like you said, it looks like a nice clean flow. Yes. So you you never know outside the overlay that any of those. Yeah. Whatever those different characteristics of the paths, mm -hmm. you don't know what happened. No. And so yeah, that's right. And so from the outside of the system, because we get, we reorder the packets, you would see typically see a higher latency with this. This you see a really good low latency here. You see more throughput, but a potentially a little bit higher latency. Can we use all three of these modes concurrently? Yes. So basically, you can use any of these and concurrently. And so it may be that you want to use this for voice. You want to use this for some kind of high throughput replication that you're doing, okay. and then you want to use this for everything else. And so, you know, I think um, one of the things we sort of see coming when we look at some of the other vendors is it looks like people want to say they want to have a debate about packet by packet or flow by flow. 
Um, we think both of them make sense and we want to let the customer choose on an um, application by application or overlay by overlay case um, which type of um, path control they are using. So for any, so the latency, there's a certain processing latency that you create by doing this type of stuff? It's like an order of a millisecond. Right. Um, so the, it's less than that, but I'll round it up to a millisecond right. um, to, to do the forward error correction. When you get to the far side, you have to reconstruct the packet. Um, but that, that doesn't take, that, you know, it just takes an order of a millisecond. Yeah. What can add a little bit of delay is if you want us to reorder everything. Yeah. And so there's a real, if you want to have reordering, there's a reordering time you have that, to buffer to do the mm -hmm. right? yeah, and you or the server, so yeah, and so it's not really. You do it better than the server. Yes, yeah, and it off offloads the server, and you know I think that. So, when people ask about a delay, is there a CPU related processing delay? No, it's it's negligible. Yeah. Is there a is there a potential delay if you're reordering? Yes. Yeah. But, but it's the same. It either happens here or there, I like to say. The flip side of this is, I assume you're doing you know, TCP transmission over the curve. You're flattening that out as um, part of this, or is that part of the WAN off? So the, yeah, the base, um, our base uh, capability yeah. is, um, does not include TCP proxying. So everything's being carried at layer 3, and I think that, that seems to but be... You're not, you're not smoothing the flow into the rated bandwidth? Uh, not, not, in the, not in the base functionality. Right. When you upgrade to boost, mm -hmm. you're getting TC, full TCP proxying and compression and deduplication, all the typical WAN optimization features. Right. And, and at that you, point, you're grooming the flow to hit the targeted yeah. bandwidth so there's no discards or yes. drops. That's right. And, and that, that's when they're 30% of it. They say, some people claim 30% efficiency were gains when they implement those features. Is that yes. reasonable? I think it, you know, it's one of those things where your mileage may vary. Some yeah. people see a lot better than that. Some people would see less than that. But mm. as, a, as, a, as a rough number, that's not so yeah, far off. Yeah, yeah, I believe it's like bigger on one, 10 gig links than it is mm -hmm. on 1 gig link. Like 10 gig, you can see 40% retransmissions, whereas on one, you know, 256K links, it's much slower, much less yeah. sort of thing. So it varies. Okay. So I was thinking that the, the latency incurred might be offset by better packet loss, by less packet loss, yes. or retransmissions. Yeah, and certainly when you're using our boost package and, you're, and you're, we're using our TCP stack for the WAN, it's optimized for that case. And so you'll see LAN-like performance and um, the reordering thing is inside the WAN segment. So you, it just looks like a nice big fat pipe. 